Good morning and welcome to our worship service for Sunday morning, April the 3rd of 2022. And we're so glad to be with you here at First Baptist Church in Holka. A few announcements. Our audiovisual fund is growing. We now have $16.92. If you wish to give to that, please indicate that on your envelope. Our Easter offering is doing great. I think right now the total that we had as of Friday was $15.07, but I think it's more this morning. If you look at our puzzle piece that is on our mission board um, display here in front of me, you will notice that there are only two parts that are not colored in. That's all that we lack for our North American missions offering. Next Sunday, our men are going to have a brotherhood breakfast at 7 o'clock Sunday morning. Also next Sunday, we'll have our business meeting after the evening service. Saturday, April the 23rd, will be our church-wide yard sale starting at 7 a.m. And there's some details about the church-wide yard sale on the back of your bulletin. And if you'll take a look at that with me. It says we're asking for any donations that you'd like to get rid of. Clothes, shoes, toys, furniture, household items. You can drop them off at the church office. Or if you will let us know, someone will come and pick them up. Angie Hallford, Taylor Kelly, Christy Greaves are our people that are in charge of the church-wide yard sale. And I know we have already been getting things in that have been stored in our Family Life Center getting ready for this yard sale. So whatever you have, we will be welcome to be a part of that. Uh, a reminder to the senior adults planning to attend the ARC Encounter October 3rd through 6th. We we'll ask you to sign up on the form at the back hall by the water fountain by April the 30th. You need to do a deposit of $100 per person, $200 per couple by April the 30th in the church office. They'll be making the reservations and purchasing tickets for the art and for the Creation Museum in May. So that is coming up if you are planning to make that trip. That will be the fall Young at Heart trip this year. Let me remind you too that our weekly offerings, we have a, a weekly need calculated and some weeks we don't quite meet that need. So remember to give to our weekly offerings. We have offering plates in the back in the foyer and in the front here. If you're joining us on Facebook Live or watching the recast, you can drop your offerings by the church at 504 Griffin Avenue or you can mail them in to PO Box 205 here in Holka, Mississippi. We're going to pray together, then we're going to see our Annie Armstrong focus video for the week. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Gracious Father, we just ask you to be with us today as we study your word together, Lord, as we consider what you have to say to us. And Lord, as we move into this Easter season, keep our hearts and our minds focused on you and on what you are doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Denver is such a beautiful place, but it's a very lonely place. People are just looking for community. There is one marijuana dispensary for every 2,000 people, one brewery for every 7,000, and one evangelical church for every 32,000 people. And the Lord has just like softened my heart to that. And I'm like, I have to go. A journeyman is a recently graduated college student who then serves for two years in a city to help support the church plan that needs help um, and needs more resources to further their mission. And so my biggest thing as journeymen is relationships, taking time to hear someone's story and hear what needs they have and just like be friends with them without a hidden agenda. Like with Placebridge Academy, which is a refugee magnet school, there was people praying that there would be strong believers come into that community and reach them. We actually found out that one of the community directors there at the school is a believer, and she was the door into letting us come in and serve their community. We are reaching 40 different countries in one place. There is so much work to be done and so few laborers to help do it. I think that's why I pour my heart and soul into these mission teams. They can just like catch a little bit of vision of what's going on here so more of them will come. Well, like it was just yesterday that I was a college student and I gave God this blank check and truly gave up control. 
and he's brought me here. And that's just a little bit of what your Easter offering will do. At this time, I'll invite our choir to come down. Our choir is providing our call to worship this morning. We have a few choir members out, but we are going to make a joyful noise to the Lord. So we ask them to come down and for you to listen prayerfully at our call to worship. so hard and being so faithful. At this time, our children are going to be headed out for Children's Church, and we are going to sing the Servant Song. We are trying Let me be happy. 
singing this morning with the solid rock. Mike, I believe we're going to sing all four verses of this one. singing this morning and you may be seated as you're turning in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20 and we're looking at verses 20 through 28 the conditions for true greatness in Matthew chapter 20 verses 20 through 28 His grace runs deep. 
for that, Miss Melinda, and thank you, choir, as well this morning for the special music and the call to worship, and hopefully you have made your way to Matthew chapter 20. do want to mention a few things and uh, remind you of a few things as well that Miss Melinda has already touched on. do want to invite all of our men and boys to be here next Sunday morning at 7 o'clock for our Brotherhood Breakfast, and uh, David Huffman has enlisted some volunteers, and if you would like to help out with the with that, you can see him uh, this week, get with him this week on that. Also, do want to remind uh, you that our uh, community sunrise service will be on April the 17th, Easter Sunday morning at 7 o'clock there on the square in Hawkins. So do remember that coming up on the 17th of April. Do have a card to read this morning. It says, thanks everyone for the love and support during the loss of my mother. It is always a comfort and blessing to have friends like you. Love you all, Harlan and family. And we'll put that up on the uh, bulletin board there in the hallway where you can look at that uh, after services. But this morning we are going to be looking in Matthew chapter 20 and verses 20 through 28 at the conditions for true greatness. Last week we were in Matthew chapter 17. We saw the splendor of the Savior as they were on the Mount of Transfiguration. And the disciples have been following Jesus, and we're skipping forward in the story to Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 28, where Jesus has just told the parable of the worker in the vineyard and has once again spoken about his death and how he will have to be crucified. He will have to pay the penalty for our sin debt and be delivered over to the Gentiles to be mocked and scourged and crucified, but on the third day he would rise again. And the process of this, if you were to go back in Matthew chapter 19, about verse 28, it says, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So that's where this argument is about to come from, where this misunderstanding of what Jesus has said leads to this uh, conversation and a teaching moment for Jesus once again with his disciples as he will give them the conditions for true greatness. And so let's start out reading verses 20 and 21 of Matthew chapter 20. The Bible says, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him, and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we come to you this morning. We do thank you once again for another opportunity to gather in your house and sing praises unto your name, to worship and fellowship together as brothers and sisters in Christ and Lord we would and do pray this morning that you would help us to understand the condi conditions for true greatness, that we would be the servants in the kingdom that you have placed us here to be and called us to be, and Lord, that we would desire to honor and glorify your name in all that we do. And Lord, we do pray as always, if there's someone here who doesn't know you as Savior and Lord of their life, that they would surrender all to you before it is too late. And Lord, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The conditions for true greatness is what Jesus is uh, addressing this morning with his disciples and with us as well. Uh, as we'll notice, the disciples still had much to learn. And we as disciples today, we as Christians today, still have much to learn concerning our role in the kingdom and our calling in the kingdom on what the Lord has placed us here to do, what he has placed us here to be. And ultimately, we are to remember who we are representing. We are to represent Christ. We are to magnify his name. We are to glorify his name. We are to honor his name. We are to live for him. He came to serve the disciples. He came to serve us. But we have to understand that as we are now living for Christ, as we are now worshiping Christ, as we are now serving Christ, that we live for him. He desires to use us, chooses to use us. 
to make an impact for his kingdom here on earth. That's why the church is here. That's why those who make up the church are here. He hasn't raptured the church out yet. He hasn't called us home yet. And so there is work still to do. There are souls that still need to be reached with the gospel. There are seeds that still need to be planted. There is much that we can be doing as we anticipate and wait for the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to rapture the church. Jesus has made these statements. He has told the disciples what's going to take place with him, how he is going to be mocked, he's going to be scourged, ultimately he will be crucified. They still have in their mindset, they still have in their frame of mind at this time that he has come to set up an earthly kingdom, that he is going to destroy and overthrow, overthrow the rulers of the world at that time, set up his earthly kingdom, and they are going to be ruling and reigning with him almost immediately. And that is what leads to what takes place here with James and John. Now we know James and John, along with Peter, were on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. They were a part of the inner circle of disciples. And so James and John decide they're going to ask this question before Peter gets an opportunity to. <laughs> they want this honor. They want this glory. They want the seats of prominence and power and position. That's what they're looking for here when they make this request. But what we're going to notice this morning is that as Christians, we are to humbly identify with Jesus and serve others. James and John at this point were not necessarily interested in serving others. They wanted to have the power. They wanted to have the prestige. And they wanted to have everybody answering to them. They would be next in line in command to Jesus Christ is basically what they're seeking here. And that is where the request comes in. And you'll notice here that Salome is believed to be the one who made the request for her children or may have even encouraged James and John to make this request. But the idea here is, is that they came, they were worshiping him, and even it says they're desiring a certain thing of him, so they understood the importance of prayer, but they didn't come with the right mindset of prayer. They didn't come with the right heart of prayer. They came with a selfish reasoning and even in their worship. And so it is a, a challenge for us as we think about the request in verses 20 and 21 to make sure that whenever we worship, we enter into worship with a proper mindset and a proper viewpoint. We understand that we are entering into the presence of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who has made it possible to enter into his presence, enter boldly into his throne room of grace. And so we enter with a humble mindset, a humble heart, understanding that he paid the ultimate price. He paid the debt I was never going to be able to pay so that I could enter into his presence. I can worship him. I can adore him. I can magnify him. I can glorify him. It's all about him. It's nothing to do with us. And so we humble ourselves in his presence and we understand that he is pouring his uh, self into us. He is giving us, equipping us, and has given us and equipped us with everything that we need to honor him, to serve him, to magnify him and to carry out his kingdom work here on earth. And as we identify with him, as we get in his presence, as we get in his word, as we study and meditate upon scripture, we will have a proper mindset in prayer. We will have a proper mindset when it comes to desiring things because what we'll notice is that our wills will line up with the will of God and we'll be praying in the will of God so we will be praying according to the will of God and humbly submitting ourselves to his will for our lives that's not what we see at this point yet with James and John now, ultimately they will but that's not where they're at yet and so that's why we have to understand that there is still much for us to learn as Christians we don't have it all figured out yet. We're not like the teenagers in the room. We don't have it all figured out yet. Okay. Everybody's awake. We're good. All right. So we 
don't have it all figured out yet. And I used to be a teenager at one time, so I know I thought I had it all figured out. Mom and Daddy didn't know what they were talking about. I had it all figured out until I grew up and got older. Now I realize I don't know it all, and I don't have it figured out. But God has it all placed for us in His Word. And we can read, and we can study, and we can grow, and we can mature, and we can progress. It was It's a part of that process of sanctification that we go through as Christians, so that's why it's important that we read the Word ourselves, that we study the Word ourselves, that we pray over the Word ourselves. That's why it's important that we gather with other believers in Bible study and pray together and worship together. It's why it's important that we do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but that we gather together as often as we can so that we can grow, so that we can mature, so that we can reach our full potential as Christians as disciples. And so it's all about having the proper mindset. It's all about having the proper perspective whenever we make these requests. Am I praying from a selfish heart? Am I praying out of a selfish desire? Or is my heart in line with the will of God and I'm praying according to His will and plan for my life? Ultimately, that's not what we see at this point because the mother says unto Jesus in verse 21, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. They're remembering what Jesus said in, verses, in, in chapter 19, verse 28, and they're getting back to that mindset and they're thinking, all right, we've been told there's going to be the 12 thrones, and so we want the two thrones closest to Jesus. We want to be on his right hand and his left hand. We want to be the one calling the shots. We want to be the ones making the decision. That was the wrong request. That was the wrong remind that was the wrong mindset. That was the wrong perspective for them to have. And Jesus addresses that with his response. In verses 22 and 23. Jesus answered and said. You don't know what you're asking. He said if you really thought about what you just said. You wouldn't have said that. I'm reminded often. And I remind other people often. We were given two ears and one mouth for a reason. We're to listen twice as much as we speak. And if they would have been truly listening. And thinking about and meditating and pondering what Jesus had said in chapter 19, verse 28, plus what he had just said in verses 17 through 19, they never would have asked that question. Even if they would have been thinking that, it should have caused them to step back a minute and think about what they were about to do and not do it. But they do it anyway. And Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Jesus said, remember what I just said. Remember that I said I will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock me, they will scourge me, and ultimately they will crucify me. Jesus had just said that. And so Jesus said, that's the cup I'm about to drink. That's what I'm about to go through. So are you really able to do that? And he, he, uh, he said, they say unto him in the last part of verse 22, we are able. Once again, they don't stop. They don't think. They don't back up just a little bit and ponder what Jesus has just said. Ultimately, they answer, we're able. Because they were desiring that power. They were desiring that prominence. They were desiring to be uh, in a position of power in the kingdom. Now, James and John wanted a share of the prestige and power, but they didn't want to be servants. And so Jesus, he answers and he reveals, first of all, in verse 22, their ignorance. But before we get on James and John so much about their ignorance and even their mother and asking this question, we need to understand that we are more like the disciples than we probably care to admit. 
We are more like the disciples probably than we really care to admit because often we want privilege and power. We're not serving on the committee to be servants. We want to have that position and power. We're not serving in other places in the church because that's what God has led us to do and called us to do and given us an opportunity to do and equipped us to do. We want the privilege and power. The problem is we want the privilege and power without service and commitment. Jesus is calling the disciples to serve one another and to serve others. And ultimately, that's what we see in Jesus' life as you look through his three and a half year public ministry. He was constantly serving others, taking care of others, providing for others. And so he addresses their ignorance. He says, you don't know what you just asked. You, you have no clue. What you're saying. F.B. Meyer said this concerning the disciples. He said, These men slept in Gethsemane, forsook the master when he was arrested, and at least one of them failed him at the cross. We can only follow Christ in his cup and baptism after we have been endued with the spirit of Pentecost. For us as Christians, once we have been filled with the Holy Spirit, we are to walk according to the Spirit. We are to walk in newness of life. We are to allow Christ to transform us from the inside out so that as that takes place, we are making the request from a proper re uh, mindset and perspective and desiring Jesus to respond accordingly. Jesus makes this response to these disciples at this point because their request was made out of ignorance. Which leads us as Christians to examine ourselves. How well do we know God's word? How well do we know his word? The psalmist said that the Bible, God's word, is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. He would tell us to hide God's word in our hearts so that we may not sin against God. That's why mama and daddies should teach the importance of reading the word of God, of studying the word of God. And they should be examples as well as they read and study the word of God. It's why vacation Bible school is important. It's why Sunday school is important. It's why Bible study classes and discipleship classes are important because the more we read, the more we study, the more we pray over the Word of God, the closer we get to Him and the more we grow in Him. We are not to remain babes in Christ. Yes, we are to desire the sincere milk of the Word of God, as Peter would say, but we are to get into the meat of the Word of God. We shouldn't be hearing like the churches did that Paul addressed where he told them that they were ignorant and he wanted to lead them further into the Gospels, further into the Scriptures, but he couldn't because of their ignorance. We should desire to know God's will. We should desire to be moving according to His will and His plan for our life. And we find that as we read, study, and meditate upon the Word of God and allow His Holy Spirit to to continue to guide us and speak to us. Jesus told the disciples that that's what the Holy Spirit would do. That he would guide them all into all truth. As he revealed himself to them and to us in and through his word. So not only does Jesus address their ignorance in verse 22 of chapter 20. But he also addresses their inability in verse 23. He said unto them in verse 22. Three, you shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. But it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. So we see that Jesus himself was humbled and surrendered to the will of God the Father. And he said, even if I desire to give you those seats, I can. That's up to God. He's already got that determined. He's already got that worked out. He's already got that set in place.
What you'll notice as we study out history, these two men would be baptized with suffering. They would drink the cup of suffering. James would be the first martyr of the faith. And we know that John was ultimately put in exile on the Isle of Patmos and dealt with suffering that way. We are to have the proper mindset. We are to have the proper perspective. We are to make the request according to the will of God and the plan of God for our life. As we read and study the word of God, we should not still be ignorant of the things of God for our life. But we do have everything here that we can read and study and meditate upon that is fresh from the lips of God that help us to grow and to mature and to progress in the faith. Now, when you get to verse 24, you're going to notice the resentment. It leads to some righteous indignation from the disciples, or at least you could say you would hope that's what it was, but ultimately that's probably not what it was. It says in verse 24, And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. Now, we would think maybe that was righteous indignation, that they were offended, that... James and John would have asked this out of ignorance and had kind of not been in the proper mindset and perspective, but that's more than likely not where the other ten disciples were coming from. You know what they got upset about? That they didn't think about it first. That it wasn't their idea. That they didn't, hadn't already went to Jesus and, and asked for those places of position and prominence themselves because Jesus continued to teach them and tell them and prophesy to them what was going to take place, what was coming as they were on their way back to Jerusalem. And the whole time, they just kept jockeying for position. They wanted the power seat. They wanted to be in authority. They wanted people serving them. They wanted to be able to call the shots. Isn't that the way it is with us? That's what we want in our life, right? It's what our world teaches us. We want to be the ones calling the shots. We want to go to God and tell God what he needs to give us, when he needs to give it to us, how he needs to give it to us, so that we can do what we want to do and only serve him whenever we have time or whenever it's convenient for us or when it feels right to us. But that's not what we're called to do. We are to die to self daily. We are to surrender our lives to Christ on a daily basis. We are to take up our cross and follow him. But how often do we do that? How often are we willing to do that? What we see is more often we're probably like the disciples were here. And we can spend a lot of time arguing. We can spend a lot of time stepping on other people and knocking other people down on our way to the top. When ultimately, it's not about how many people are serving us, but how many people are we serving? How many people are we making an impact in their life? How many people are we taking care of and providing for? How many people are we praying for? Not desiring anything in return from them, but simply because we love them and have a heart for them like Jesus did. It gets to verse 25 through 28, and Jesus gives us the requirements concerning the conditions for true greatness. He said in verse 25, as he called unto them, you know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. He said that's how the Gentiles conduct themselves. That's how the model works for them, but that's not how the model works in the kingdom of God. In verses 26 through 28, he said, But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. As you remember, Christ entering into the Last Supper with the disciples, what was the first thing that he did? He washed their feet. He served them. That's what he's talking about here. Whoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. 
Jesus was the Savior of the world, is the Savior of the world, was about to die on the cross, was going to go through the suffering and the shame and the pain and the ridicule, all those things that are talked about in Scripture, and yet he was willing to humble himself and wash the disciples' feet as they were still fighting over who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. They wouldn't even wash each other's feet. He said in verse 27, And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Remember, it's not about how many are serving you, but how many are you serving? How many people are you ministering unto? Because what we'll see is if we're serving others, somebody's going to be serving us. That's what it's all about. We're serving one another. We're providing for one another. We're taking care of one another. Everybody's needs will be met if we have the right mindset and proper perspective and attitude when it comes to being a servant in the kingdom of God. That's why he said in verse 28, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. When you get to verse 28, Jesus uses this tense situation to set forth the conditions for true greatness because in verse 25 he said, greatness as viewed by the Gentiles is seen there. In verses 26 through 28, we see greatness viewed by God. Jesus came to suffer. Can I remind you this morning that if you are a true disciple of Jesus Christ, you will suffer for the faith. In some way, you will suffer for the faith. Now, we may not be like James and be beheaded. We may not be like Peter and be crucified upside down. We may not be like some of these other martyrs of the faith, but we could be like some of those that were mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 in the Hall of Faith. And so what we have to understand is we will suffer for the faith. Jesus was laying that out there. He was putting that out there, but he was saying that he didn't come to be ministered unto, but to minister. And if all we're doing is sitting around waiting for someone else to minister to us, we're not doing what we were called to do. And that's to minister to others, to provide for others. Jesus came to suffer. He willingly walked into the jaws of suffering and death on our behalf. How far are we willing to go for Christ? How far are we willing to go for Christ? I'll walk this far, but that's as far as I'm walking. I'll go as long as you call me to this area, but if you call me to that area, I'm not going. I'll serve in this ministry, but I won't serve in that one. I'll do this for the church, but I won't do that. How far are we willing to go? Jesus came to suffer. Not only did he come to suffer, but he came to save. Jesus had been trying to tell the disciples these things. He had been trying to show the disciples these things. Through his parables, through his teachings, through his sermons, through his miracles, he was letting people know that he came to save. That's what he's talking about there. He identifies with us by calling himself the Son of Man. And he said that he came to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus paid the ultimate price. He paid the ultimate price, and whenever you begin to think about that word ransom, the idea is somewhat like a hostage situation. We were in a hostage situation to our sin, to our previous lifestyle. We were dead in our trespasses and sin. We were on a road that leads to hell and eternal damnation. But Jesus paid the price to release us from a hostage situation and when you get past John 3, 16 and the 3, 17, 18 and following, Jesus himself said that those who refuse to surrender their lives to Jesus Christ trample over the cross. 
they condemn themselves to hate it. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus paid it all so that you could be released, so that I could be released from a hostage situation, so that I could know the conditions for true greatness is to serve others. And to esteem others better than ourselves. Jesus came to show us how to live. So we can be thankful for Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And the gospels that record for us what Jesus did while he was here on earth. And ultimately we notice that he came to serve us. These are our true, uh, our conditions for true greatness. We must be willing to suffer we must point people to Jesus, who is the only one who can save them, because he is our substitute. And as we reflect his love, his grace, his mercy, we will show others how to truly live as we serve others and serve one another to honor and glorify Christ. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you can know Him today as your Savior and Lord before you leave this place. And if you do know Him, how far are you willing to go? Notice these conditions of true greatness. Serve others. Esteem others better than self. Deny yourself daily. Take up your cross and follow Him. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now.